Marie, easily one of the most divisively loved or hated characters among all of the Persona game characters. Or, if I'm honest, it seems that most people who vocalize their opinion just kind of hate her. Marie is a character written exclusively for Persona 4 Golden, and is, despite being a new addition, an important one, since she ties into the final, final boss of the true ending, as well as gives a further perspective on the mythology presented therein, the original game. Marie is an amnesiac girl found wandering and brought into the Velvet Room due to Igor seeing the thread of her life possibly intertwining with yours. The Velvet Room is all about human potential and testing the way mankind's various representatives will act, either in accordance with positive variables or not, i.e. with the bad endings. So from the get-go, since Marie is sort of a hostage in the Velvet Room, only allowed to go out when given permission, even her clothes being loans from there, it should be immediately apparent that whomever Marie is, she is likely not human, or likely not just human, at least. She could be a spirit, or an amalgamation, or subconsciousness made real. The Velvet Room is what bridges the link between the conscious and the subconscious, after all. She could be a fluke, or a victim of some crazy situation. At the beginning, it's really hard to say, and her initial introduction with the dropped note, I think, is pretty innocuous and well-implemented enough. Marie has a very Sundade personality and writes poetry. She rarely is honest with her own feelings, which connects to her role in the story as a sort of antithesis to you. She wants to know who she was, and she wants to find the truth about her past and how she ended up where she is, but unlike you, part of her believes wholeheartedly that she'll never find it. As she gets frustrated more and more with finding her own truth, Persona 4 Golden reveals itself as a game about seeking the truth above all else, and bearing the fogs that others won't, in order to enjoy, understand, and experience the breadth of life to the fullest. Marie is someone who is doing this, but with begrudged frustration, and over the course tries to convince you that the truth never really mattered or never existed at all. Even on a meta level, she sort of issues a challenge to the player, mentioning the intentionality of how Chie and Yukiko are always wearing their respective colors, challenging aspects of the realism of this game world that we often overlook naturally as they contribute to a more cohesive story. But reality, truth, is not entirely cohesive like that. Truth is rough and uncertain, bending and twisting, and while I think that the story of Persona 4 does a good job at displaying this aspect through the search for the killer, it's true that many other aspects have become normalized when normal simply isn't what they are. She's not a bad person for issuing these challenges, of course, whether it be to the player or to the protagonist, but she represents a sort of antithesis for what the story searches for. And once Marie does finally find her truth, she hates what she finds and regrets searching for it in the first place. Elements of this idea are actually already in base Persona 4, via Cole's link in some of Teddy's arc, but while Cole responds positively to the experiences he goes through, Marie responds negatively. Her negative responses and general lack of faith and confidence is actually a welcome balance to the game where people seem to successfully find contentment in their struggles pretty consistently. At least thematically, this is how Marie plays into the central message and story. Marie's social link centers on her lost memory and the only thing she feels is part of her past, the only thing that she had on her when she was found, an old comb. Over the course of her social link, she goes through many different places questioning modern technology and unintentionally being rude as she questions the meaning of human relationships and what value they could offer. Ultimately, she has trouble gripping with those things. She doesn't understand why people continue to assist her when they have no quote-unquote reason to. And while she doesn't understand, she slowly finds herself having fun with everyone. While with many, many segments, I have gone into each individual link in order to fit the individual added narrative elements, thematic textures, and characterization moments, I'm going to largely talk generally about Marie's link here with a few specific things to point out. That's mainly because what I already told you makes up a bulk of her social link. With her link being stunted from progressing somewhat, as some of her scenes require party members from later in the game, despite she herself being introduced almost immediately. Since her discovering her memories also plays into the plot majorly for the true ending, she can't make real headway until after her social link is complete, and when the plot demands that she remembers and become relevant. I'm being a bit disingenuous here though, she actually does make some headway in her link, just not toward the goal of remembering. 
Before Marie remembers, she comes to grips with the idea that she may never, in fact, do that, but she realizes even if she did lose her old memories, she can still make new ones. She realizes all the fun times that she had spending with the investigation team, and especially you, and by the end, isn't upset or anxious anymore over remembering or not. She becomes content with just choosing to live the current life that she wants, the current life as she sees it. This is something hard to do in reality and is a really good lesson. While elements again of this are handled in Cole's social link, and even Dojima's, Marie pertains to herself. It says directly in this link that some truths may actually be unobtainable. And that is true, for better and worse. You may not have the technology or the physical or mental capacity. It may be impossible for you specifically, or in your current time, place, or circumstances, to find the answers that you want. But the answers you need will always be available to you. The answers that make you the person you are will always be within your fingertips and within your power. And I think that's a really nice resonating message for anyone who ever felt so lost in finding themselves, either. It makes it even more sad then that right after she felt this strength and finished her social link, finished her character arc and grew as a person to stop being so cynical, right after she stopped and gave up on searching for her past, that it confronted and left her distraught, like she just had to leave this life that she'd learned to love as if it were a lie. This is a theme that isn't really explored with the other links, which is that the truth may come when you least want or expect it when you least want or even need it. Truths about reality, about things that you love and hold dear, may be given to you. And so this idea is no longer, how do you see past the lies to seek the truth? And now, how do you accept the truth and have the strength not to avert your eyes to what has been presented to you? Marie really does both and neither thing here. She accepts what she sees as the truth and is so blindsided and upset that she does confront what she sees. But the her that she sees is so confusing and emotional that she chooses to self-isolate instead of reaching out to those who have helped her find a place to belong in the first hand. She regresses into herself and naturally falls back on the comfort of being alone instead of solving her problems with other people who can offer their fresh perspectives. This reinforces the lack of confidence she always had and had just put away from the methods and mentalities of her friends. And now that they mean so, so much to her, she believes they won't have the stomach to make the hard choice, to make the right choice in her eyes. That they will try to save her and go down with the ship, the thing that she now least wants, now that she actually appreciates and cares for the people that she's come to know. The thing she lacks faith in is that another non-tragic option is possible. And to an extent, you can't blame Marie. She's someone with a hopeful ideal dream that she feels will never become reality. She's so clearly swept up in the romance of life from the way that she memorializes her memories to her poems of the player, as cringy as I may personally find them. Marie has a clear lust for life, but whether it's a lack of faith in herself or an obsession over the brutal nature of reality, she locks herself away in the dungeon, literally, to avoid her hurt. She convinces herself that the role that she's been confined to is fine enough for her, but that role, in some regard, is a lie. And that's what the investigation team aims to get across. The name of Marie's dungeon is the Hollow Forest. The reason behind the title is actually referred to as a visual metaphor before the Amino Sagiri fight, when he takes over Adachi's body. He says, this is part of the sea of unconsciousness that exists within human hearts. A hollow forest born from bloated desire and false imagery. Humans view things as they see fit. They wish not for truth, but rather prefer the undesirables be hidden in fog. Still, humans fear what they cannot see. That brief yearning for truth becomes a ray of light which breaks the fog and torments the shadows. That's why they attack and kill whoever's nearby at that time. A hollow forest. Then, this place isn't simply affected by people's hearts. It actually exists inside them? Mankind abandoned its pursuit of truth placing itself in the depth of chaos and falsehood. Thus, my strength has grown, and the fog will not lift. 
Your world will be engulfed by the Hollow Forest. It was I who made it possible for you to bring about this destiny. I bestowed power onto those who could brave the Hollow Forest. That is what allowed you to come in contact with this world, and you all have done very well since. We find out that Marie has intended to take power of this world fusion along with her, as she is the catalyst. So, wrapping herself in a tomb made of memories that she has grown to treasure, the Hollow Forest will no longer seek to fuse with reality. Instead, it dies with her. As for the imagery in her dungeon, despite myself hating the gameplay gimmicks for it, aesthetically, the dungeon looks beautiful and has a lot of meaning behind it. The giant clay sculptures that you see in Marie's dungeon are Haniwa, hollowed out clay tomes used to decorate in and around the grave of a tomb. The Haniwa ask for continued service in the afterlife. Although the color has all but faded since these were mostly mass-produced in the 6th century of Japan and prior due to Buddhism changing some of the cultures, some of the Haniwa contain geometric patterns and colors of red, blue, and white. There are many theories as to what Haniwa represented, with some allusion in the Nihong Shoki seeming to imply them as replacements for a lack of servants or assistance, or of spirits to protect the tomb, but the full meaning has been lost. I think Marie is her own Haniwa, or at least she feels that she is. She feels like she has been hollowed out, removed of her memories, and although she had previously died and been separated, she continued to work and bring about her mission, even to her dead memories. Her colors are also red, blue, white, and black. Aside from black, these are the colors that the Haniwa were believed to be inscripted with near the 6th century. She was hollowed out of her memories and self, but filled with the fog, and now she resigns herself to a grave so that she can carry what she believes is best, to take the fog down with her. The colors we see Marie with when we rejoin her is just the red and white, still fitting of the Haniwa theme, but this is where we find out her true form, Kusumi no Okami. Now, Okami refers to her being a god, but I will say for the first time researching the series, I really felt like ripping my hair out. I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you, telling you there's some tangential connection between something barely related in the Nihong Shoki or Kojiki and con that off to you as analysis. I won't do it. But I'm going to tell you what I think some of Kusumi's influences are, since I think that she's actually an original god, not directly based off of anything specific from Shintoism. That's right. There's no clear origin to her ties to mythology, something extremely rare for Atlas and especially Persona 4. Even Japanese blogs that I read through state their confusion over who she could possibly be representing, some of which are resigning themselves to the belief that she must be a stand-in for a forgotten god who we lack or lost the historical manuscripts for. And in a way, that actually fits Marie's character really well, or at least whom she wants to be or who she was. Someone that leaves your memories and sacrifices herself without leaving a trace. Other ideas of her are as an illusion, Kurao Kami, a great dragon birthed from when Izanagi killed Kagatsuchi, and the blood splattered causing Kurakami's birth. Kurao Kami is a representative of mist, rain, and mystery, so that makes some tangential sense, but her being a dragon is never really referred to, and this idea of mystery is all we've really got that's super special to go off of. Still another rabbit hole took me to Kumano Kusubi, who actually has many alternate names, all of which being similar to Kusumi, like Kumano Kushi and Kumano O Shihomi. This god is the last of six and is tied to the story of Amaterasu emerging from the cave. The god was born from Suzano taking one of the beads from Amaterasu. This has some application, as the robe that Marie wears is similar to depictions of Amaterasu, and it is only after the endless pleas of the people that Amaterasu emerged from the cave. Except, Kusubi is a male god. So really, while this type of wear was commonly depicted in that art period, there isn't a solid single meaning there. Her name even, Kusumi, uses katagana instead of kanji, which makes it so the meaning derived from various kanji spellings of this already fairly obscure name will be left to speculation. 
Still, some meanings for kusumi I think there can be some confidence in. For example, one spelling of kusumi means a story from long ago, and to live or reside somewhere. Marie states that her meaning of being in Inaba was to reside there as a sort of analysis of the human hearts of Inaba, relaying her findings to Amino and Kunino Sigiri. So aspects of her come from Izanami herself. Izanami's children, grandchildren, she gathers from many places in mythology and seems to have been intentionally left unfindable, mythologically speaking. This does also tie into her own frustrated search for herself, and eventual decision to be her own person, though. So, thematically, it makes total sense that she wouldn't be based on another mythological character, but would be original in her own way. Another thing I've seen going around is that Marie is an aspect of Izanami, but I think all the clues actually point to the reverse. Plus, why would you believe Izanami's word anyway? She's like the main bad guy and represents the idea of lies in Persona 4. You see, demons and gods in Persona are not real like they are in their sister series, SMT. Instead, the formation of demons and gods manifest in the human subconscious in Persona. They are based on cognition, not actual reality. At least not alone in human reality. To control, consume, or destroy the world, they have to come up with methods of crossing over to the human society. Whether it be Nyx's slow arrival only after a cult has taken control of the minds of the masses, or Persona 5 when apathy has taken place over the minds of the public, ushering in a god of control. Or Izanami, then, bringing out the hollow forest and fusion of the TV realm in Inaba through the fog. None of the final bosses or gods tangibly exist over here in the natural world. They have to use the human mind to slowly find a way to cross over. Humans, on the other hand, exist in reality because they contain egos. The ability to create and control their own cognition. Loki could never change his job and decide to be Zeus. Pixie could never work hard to become Ishtar. They are fundamentally separate concepts entirely. And while some demons, like in mainline SMT, can evolve into others, oftentimes the lore connections make them virtually the same person. Like how the Irish boy Satanta, after slaying the guard dog, was given as a replacement of the guard dog and the name Su Chulane. They are the same person, at different phases in their same mythology. So, why out of all the parts of Izanami is Marie allowed to easily move around in the human realm? All things in the game seem to point to the idea that it's because she is the ego that was stripped from Izanami's corpse. She was the catalyst, the bridge between the ideals of the cognition and the ability of the human realm. Marie is the new reincarnation of the goddess, the literal Shen Megami Tensei. Marie is Izanami, stripped of all of her history, her memories, only retaining the aspects of herself like her personality that make up her ego. And her personality fits this really well too, as with her sometimes vindictive yet overall romantic view of the world, her want to see creation, like and truth, yet her belief that truth is a lie, fits into the Izanami we see in the Kojiki. As much as I don't personally enjoy her as a character, her interactions and romantic tsundere attitude, especially toward the player, make sense too, as this hot and cold element that despite the player who represents Izanagi and her, herself, Izanami being lovers in mythology, Izanami, due to her pride and wanting to be seen positively, still punished all of mankind for Izanagi looking upon her corpse in Yomotsu Hirasaka by condemning mankind to death. That seems pretty tsundere to me. Marie loves the main character, yet she gets so easily angry. The Shiminawa ropes seen throughout the dungeon have their origins also with the Amaterasu story. They were said to represent the idea that Amaterasu could not re-enter her cave to hide again. In this case, they have been used to keep you from re-entering to rescue Marie from that said cave. They also were meant to ward off disease and create a barrier between the sacred and the profane. Marie probably seeing herself as a disease destined to be released to the world through fog and kill humanity, swallowing Inaba in the hollow forest. Either interpretation fits well, as well as it being a part of the imagery for a tomb like the Haniwa. The boss of Kusumi no Okami has a few different things to note as well. 
First, if we see Marie's first phase as suppressing the bad part of herself, letting it take her over so we can defeat it, as stated in the game, the red and white colors reflect this very nicely. In Marie's outfit, the red lays underneath a draping white cloth, while only bits of tight white and silver cover the black of the second phase boss, with an enormous red cloak instead covering her body. Between her legs, there are two straps that come together in a green magatama. Their name literally means precious curved stone, and among other things, they were used for funerary situations, tying in with the whole tomb theme. Magatama were also traditionally placed around shrines, and attached to weapons that were considered to be sacred, and once upon a time were worn even as fashion accessories by women in Japan. The activity the gods, led by Suzano, performed in order to get Amaterasu to leave her cave also involved Magatama, as they decorated a tree with them, causing Amaterasu to become curious and peek her head out from the cave. As for the boss design and how it links to Marie, as opposed to her mythology, the most major one is the gimmick of her fight, which, unlike the rest of the dungeon, I actually find very well executed. Marie is someone scared of being hurt, scared to trust, who literally hold herself up away from the rest of the world and everyone so she could die in order to not burden anyone else with her life in the world. She doesn't feel like she can rely on anyone, or that if she does, she'll just let them down and hurt them in the process. She feels that she isn't worth worrying about, so in this fight, you literally, using the mechanics of the fight, have to one by one break down her walls so that you can help her. Marie resists every magic type, and so using an item to temporarily break resistances, you can finally wedge your way in until those doubtful, angry, self-hating, and regretful thoughts have been subdued, and the true Marie is ready for rescue. Throughout the fight, she throws out the same sort of doubtful, defeatist jargon that she confronted you with all the while in the game. But this time, it's even more desperate, more frustrated. After you get back with everyone, Marie confirms that the Hollow Forest is now gone, but she still doesn't understand the reason for them to help her. Once the two of you are alone, she mentions hearing a voice speaking on how humans don't seek truth and only desire a world filled with fog. She thinks that it must have been her voice, a her from a long time ago who said it, but she brushes it off. Of course, as she is the memoryless reincarnation of Izanami, the cognitive Izanami you will fight in a month for the true end, this is meant to be obvious foreshadowing and to further drive home who Marie actually is in Persona 4. Marie, or Marie, is actually a name that ironically enough means truth reinforcing the idea that while she was searching for her true self outward, trying to remember, and even as she did remember and hated what she found, she only had to ever be herself to be the true Marie. At the end of the game, we see Marie has grown very mature and is now loving life. Still seeming to contain some of her abilities, she makes up for the fog in Inaba by making the weather wonderful any time that you come around. The newscaster also refers to her as Mariko, which has the exact same meaning of truth as well, but has more of an implication of truth as in real or genuine. The ko is a common ending for a woman's name in Japan, and the sumi in kusumi could also refer to clear or pure, with a similar name kasumi sometimes referring to mist. She has reached out to her truth and is living the life that she wants with no fear of social stigma or judgment. She shouts out embarrassingly on the TV at the protagonist, although it doesn't even come across to Dojima's head that, that she could be talking about you. That sort of loud, happy outburst would have been near impossible for the judgy, cringe-detecting Sundere Marie that we met throughout the game. She's grown a lot. She's embraced the romantic side shown in her poetry, the side that wants to see humanity flourish, and that wants to be a part of it. And so finally, we sort of get a happy end on the old Kojiki story of what would have happened if Kagatsuchi never killed Izanami. Lastly, Marie is the Aeon Arcana. In a regular tarot deck, it is much more commonly referred to as the Judgment Arcana, but there's already a Judgment in the game, and it's the Investigation Team's card. Well, the Judgment is referred to as the Aeon in the Thoth tarot deck. This card is the sixth stage of spiritual enlightenment, realization. It's the first part of someone developing their own personality. 
The Hebrew letter Shin is one of the three Hebrew letters from God who created the universe. Marie was one of three pieces cut from Izanami, one of the creators of Japan, so that fits nicely with Persona 4's story. The letter Shin also comes from the poison of the snake's tooth. A magatama is sometimes speculated to mimic the shape of an animal's tooth, and green, a color of poison, as well as the color of jade, a rock used to often make magatamas and the one attached to Marie at her most volatile point. The poison of the serpent's tooth in Shen is the poison of death and redemption, a poison that defeats or transforms. The poison causes someone to drop their old personality and grow into a unified consciousness. Maybe I'm lazy, but I think that's a connection that you can attach yourself fairly easily here. On the judgment card, you see people breaking free from their coffins, having received their wisdom. Like Marie, having her false ideas pushed back, allowing her to emerge from her tomb in the hollow forest, unharmed. On the lower polarity, it's a refusal to accept the call of the self, something Marie obviously starts out vehemently doing. But by the end, from that one epilogue scene, we see a completely transformed and happy person, not just accepting the call, but gladly reveling in it. If you enjoyed this analysis, it's just one of many, many more. Please like, comment, and share with any Persona fans that you think would be interested in seeing it, as your engagement helps anyone see these at all. Subscribe and turn on notifications as well for the upcoming parts of my Ultimate Analysis series, and that was Marie. Other aspects of her character have obviously been divided into many of the other segments of this series for structural cohesion, but I think this overviews her place in the story the most. Until next time, thanks for watching.